Gilson Engineering, and you can see our entire webinar series. Engineering, uh, we're going to go ahead and keep everyone muted during the presentation this morning. Uh, we've got a lot of folks on here, so we'll keep everybody on mute. If you have any questions at any time, go ahead and type them into the chat box. And we're going to take a few breaks throughout the course of the presentation this morning, answer questions um, at, at our break points. If I see any questions that I think need to be covered at that specific time, I'll go ahead and stop Michael and uh, and we'll we'll answer those questions then. So we're going to get started in one minute. Michael, you want to go ahead and talk and make sure everybody can hear you? Sure. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm uh, really glad to be here. Um, you hear me okay? Yeah, I, I got you. I'm okay. going to give it another minute, then I'll go ahead and, and do the intro and we'll get started. Sounds good. All right, everybody, it's nine o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get the presentation started. My name is Ryan Dean with Gilson Engineering. Appreciate all of you being here with us this morning. So for this morning's webinar, we're going to focus on uh, sludge blanket monitors and also a, a filter backwash optimization product. Uh, so two different products that we're going to talk about in the webinar. This morning, Michael Emanuel from Intec is going to, to be our presenter. Uh, Intec was purchased by ATI a couple years ago, so, so it's actually ATI Intec now. And um, Michael's been doing this for, for well over 20 years. He's had a lot of time in, in the water, wastewater industry. And uh, again, appreciate everybody being here. We're gonna keep everyone on mute this morning. We're gonna do that so we can uh, keep our background noise down. If you have any questions that come up at any point during the webinar, please go ahead and, and type them into the chat box. And we have a couple designated breakpoints throughout the presentation where we will answer individual questions. And from there, uh, we're gonna cover a couple of, of installations that we have within Gilson Engineering's territory. And uh, if you have any specific questions about those, you can get with us as well. So with that, Michael, I'll hand it over to you and let you uh, do the presentation. Thank you, Ryan. Well, again, everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, just a little bit about me. I grew up on a bayou in Pensacola, Florida, and so the water industry was something that I had my eyes on for quite some time. And when I had a chance to go to school later in life, I made the decision to go into water and wastewater. Um, and I had no idea at the time, but I just have to say this at the beginning here. My years working in water and wastewater, I've come to realize that you folks who are taking care of the, the public health with uh, the work that you do, you truly are public servants and I applaud you. Uh, this, this presentation, let's see here, I'm in a little bit of trouble. What are you there we go. Yeah. There we go. I just had to get the get it so that it would it would function. So this presentation really has two parts. Uh, we're going to talk about interfaces, which is what what underwater ultrasonics do. They look for interfaces. Uh, in in our case, we looked at both sludge and granular media in gravity filters. So this presentation really does apply to both water and wastewater because. You certainly have clarifiers and solid separation processes in drinking water plants, as well as wastewater plants. And in certain areas of the country, you have filters. Of course, you have them in your water plants, uh, gravity filters, typically. And there's plenty of places around the country where you have tertiary filters for reuse water in wastewater plants. So I'm going to be showing examples from both of these, pretty much the first half of this presentation, is about how the instruments work, uh, some of the current methods out there, uh, that type of thing, and, and examples of the sludge blanket side of the business. And then 
about halfway through, I'll switch over and start talking more about the, uh, the Filter Smart product, which is the gravity filter backwash monitor. So Webster defines an interface as a surface between two uh, bodies, phases, or spaces. Uh, and, I, and I just want to press home that what this instrument does is it's sending out a sound signal and it's looking for a surface to bounce that sound signal off of. That's why it's called Echo Smart, because we're looking for an echo. Now, I had a teacher that um, he said two things regularly. The first thing he said was, never give a student an even break. And the second thing that he said was, it's never too early for a test. So if this was a live audience, I would ask for shows of hands for how many interfaces we see in this picture. And in auction style, I would be asking who sees two, who sees three, who sees four? Well, there's more along the lines of nine or 10 in here. And I just want to, to, to illustrate that this is, these are just a number of different types of interfaces. Of course, what we're gonna be looking at are interfaces in solid separation processes, okay? So here are some common measurement methods for water and wastewater. I'm sure everybody here who's in the wastewater business has either seen or run a sludge judge. Uh, basically, it's, a, it's a, uh, a clear plastic tube with markings every foot. And the idea is to take a core sample of the water column and hopefully get an accurate picture of what's down there and where it is because of course you need to know where your blanket is what we're seeing here is going to be four different measurements the first one is a very slow uh, approach to lo lowering it down into the tank and believe it or not sludge judges when you buy one they don't come with instructions because i've purchased one and there was no instructions to be found but basically what you have is this clear plastic tube with a floating ball valve down here at the very end with that little white pin sticking out and that ball valve rests in a nest, which causes a constriction of the diameter, the internal diameter of that sludge judge. So as a result, what can happen is, and notice there was just a couple of inches of sludge in that, in that particular measurement. Uh, but what happens, if, depending upon the speed with which you push, put the instrument down in the water, notice he's going in much faster now. What, what happens is, is because of that constriction, it doesn't allow the water and material to flow up into the tube as readily. So what happens is it gets to the bottom of the tank and then the water inside the tube equalizes with the water outside the tube. And what it's doing is it's sucking up sludge from the bottom of the tank. And as you can see, there was over a foot of sludge in that measurement. So now he's gonna go back in very quickly as if a storm was coming, let's say, and he's in a hurry. And well, he's letting that tube equalize, and now he's bringing it up. And lo and behold, now we have a couple of feet of sludge. As a matter of fact, five different people might call that measurement two and a half feet, two and a quarter feet, two feet. So there's some ambiguity in terms of how you read a sludge judge as well, I should say. Okay, so now he's going to go back in the fourth time, and he's going to go back to the hand over hand, very slow lowering of the, of the sludge judge. And my bet, of course, I've seen this video, but my bet is it's going to come up low again. And we all know blankets don't move that fast. So the reason I'm pointing this out is not to say everybody's doing it wrong, but what I'm saying is there's a lot of ambiguity and a lot of variability with this, with this measurement method. See, we've got about a half a foot of sludge there. So, once again, my screen kind of locks up. Sorry, bear with me here. There we go. So another method, method of measurement of, of, of the, the blanket, let's say, in a, in a tank would be a suspended solids meter. The probe has a gap down there on the business end, and there usually is a light source, and it's calibrated to certain densities, and when it 
when it goes past a, an area of a certain density, it'll it'll beep at you or give you a light flashing or what have you. The cable that's lowered down with that probe is is marked every foot or so. Uh, this is a Secchi disk. It's used to judge not not only just the cloudiness or the cleanliness of water, but also in um, gravity filters. I've seen these on poles where you can lower them down while you're doing a backwash and actually see where the top of that expanded media is. And this is one of my favorites. This is uh, what I call cups on a stick. I actually took this picture in Lawrence, Kansas, and it's literally plastic Dixie cups that have been duct taped to a stick. And the idea with these is that you put the pole or the stick down into the gravity filter to the level of the static media. And then when you run your backwash, your, your media is going to rise and it's going to fill up cups until it doesn't fill up any cups anymore. So once, the, once you pull this out, you actually just look at how many cups have media in there and you get a sense for how high that media rose at some point during that backwash. And this is another place where I usually take a show of hands and find out how many people in the audience have actually made one of these things because it's 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 pretty revealing actually because if you think about it this is this some version of this cups on a stick is has been the industry standard for how you measure media expansion in gravity filters. Uh, this is another example. These are called pan pipes or organ pipes. It's the same principle. You have a succession of uh, of hollow uh, uh, pieces of pipe, and that media is going to rise to some point where it's it's going to fill one cup but not the next. So you get some idea of how high that media rose at some point during the backwash. Here's another version that's a little bit more elegant, but literally these are still the the same method, and that's literally the 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 state of the art for how to measure media. Of course, until we started using our product to do it. Okay, so this is a good point to stop and, and ask if there's any questions. Michael, at this point, the only question that we've had come in is, is you mentioned that uh, there might be some ambiguity in in uh, in the sludge judge. So with with our instrument, is there a way to to you know account for that or or determine different uh, levels or points within the in, within the sludge profile? Oh, absolutely. Um, so let's say that, that our instrument is in a clarifier and it's reading two feet of sludge. Uh, and you have several people who are taking sludge judge measurements and one person does it fast, another person does it slow. Most likely, if you do it slow enough and if you do it, you know, accurately, you're going to get a reading that's going to match ours. So obviously the first thing to do is to, to monitor your speed with how quickly you put the sludge judge down in the water. Now there's other, there's other things that can happen. So, so I, I alluded to the possibility of several people looking at the same sludge judge, the same measurement, and giving different answers as to what that level actually is. And I've, I've actually done this on a clarifier out in California. We had five operators a brand new sludge judge, and they had a uh, a pulley and crane kind of situation, so you could pull the sludge judge up and just let it hang there. And I asked each of them to write down the value, and we got four different answers out of five operators. Okay. Uh, now, to be sure, it's not always human error. As a matter of fact, many times there's there's situations where let's say you've got a thickener in a wastewater plant or a or primary clarifier with very thick solids, high density solids. And if you've got a narrow diameter sludge judge, there's many times when you go to put that, that sludge judge down into the tank, that that material just doesn't come up into the sludge judge very readily. So you get skewed results there. So there are techniques that we have, such as instead of trying to measure all the way to the bottom of the tank, why not measure just the supernatant? In a, in a, in a case like that, where you've got very thick material, you put the sludge judge into where you think the top of that blanket is and measure just the supernatant, which is the clearer liquid that's on the top of the blanket. So, so there's all kinds of ways to, to figure out uh, where that ambiguity has come from, or that disparity, that type of thing. 
Okay, perfect. That's all we've got for now. All right, I'll continue here. Okay, so so obviously I'm here to talk about this line of equipment. This it's called Echo Smart because first of all we're looking for an echo. We're bouncing a sound signal off of a surface. And the smart part of that name refers to the fact that these are smart sensors. So the analyzer, if you will, or the computer is down in the sensor. It's a very simple line of equipment. The upper left, you've got our controller. Uh, that is not the analyzer. The analyzer is down in the sensor, okay? So then the control unit really just becomes a master of a field network of sensors. Uh, the all speak Modbus, so that's our native way of communication between the sensors and the control unit. Um, and as a result of that, um, we can create a field network of up to 16 sensors with one display unit or one control unit. The way we do that is that little smaller box on the right, the top right, that's what we call a power supply, an Echo Smart power supply. And that's, it's, it's more than a power supply, that's what you wire the sensor into. And you put one of those and a sensor out at each uh, tank that you're, you're monitoring. And then you have the opportunity to create a network of sensors. So if you've got five clarifiers, it's it's uh, it's more cost effective to do a network than to use a control unit and a sensor and a control unit and a sensor in a standalone fashion. To give you an idea, the control unit's a little over two thousand dollars, and the power supply is about eight hundred dollars. So I'd much rather be spending eight hundred bucks per tank plus the sensor and the mounting hardware than two thousand dollars per tank. So as a result, what happens is the the price per tank goes down uh, the larger that network gets. Now we have three sensors in our in our line. The one on the bottom left here is about the size of a hockey puck. Uh, and notice that it doesn't have a wiper like the one on the right does. That the one on the right is a is what we call a wiper or self-cleaning sensor. And here's an important point. You always have to, with underwater ultrasonics, you always have to have a way to keep bubbles or or gas off the face of the sensor. Uh, that wiper that you see there is not intended to do things like clear uh, grease or, or heavy accumulations off the face of the sensor. It's there to wipe bubbles off the face of the sensor because since these are underwater ultrasonic sensors, they have to be in the water to work. Within, when they're out of the water, they're not getting a return signal. If there's bubbles sufficient enough on the face of the sensor, uh, that, that can degrade or, or eliminate the signal. So the way that the, we use these, if you're, let's just take a, a wastewater clarifier that's got a surface skimmer or scum skimmer. We have to make accommodations for that skimmer coming by, okay? So we have what we call a flexible assembly. And we screw the, this, the sensor on the left without the wiper. We use that sensor, we attach it to the, multi, to the, to the what we call the multiplex or the flexible assembly, and it sits about six inches below the surface of the water. And that multiplex has guards on it such that when the surface skimmer comes by, it pushes that sensor up out of the water. And then as it passes, the sensor just splashes back down in the water. And the cool thing about that is you don't have to have a wiper. And that splashing action cleans the face of the sensor of, of a lot of things, actually. It, it, it gets all the bubbles off. And it does help keep uh, algae and that type of thing from, from growing on the face of the sensor. Now, let's say you've got a, a drinking water plant clarifier or sed basin. That tank is not going to have a surface skimmer. So we still have to have some way to clean that face of the sensor. So that's where the wiper sensor would come in. So how do these work? I'm going to talk primarily about the ultrasonics part of it. Uh, it's strictly just a time of flight measurement. Okay, We know the velocity of, of sound through water. And we know when we release a ping and we time how long it takes to come back to the sensor. So we know the time that that ping has been traveling. So then we can calculate distance. Now, in this, in this um, graphic here, what I'm showing is here's the sensor just below the, the surface of the water. It's hanging off the, cat, the, the catwalk off the handrails. Okay. And here we have the blue. This is the supernatant that I referred to earlier. This is the, the cleaner water, and this water is going up over the weirs and exiting that tank. Now, down here, we have really a couple of layers. There's a 
fluff or a rag layer or a dispersed solids layer, uh, and it forms a surface, okay? Then below that, we have a more well-settled area of sludge, and then we have the bottom of the tank, okay? So let's go back to our beer uh, picture. This might be the light material and the bottom of the glass, okay? So that is an interface, all right? As a matter of fact, what I've done is drawn in a signal that would be representative of what we're seeing here in this tank. And, and we deal with echo profiles with this product. Since it's, a, 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 uh, it's an auditory type uh, device, we get echo profiles. We draw an echo profile every time we, um, we update our, our screen. So what we're looking at here is an, the amplitude going to the right. The amplitude of this signal indicates how strong of an echo we're getting, okay? Now, this spike is very tall compared to these other little spikes, right? And that's because we're getting a lot of energy off the bottom of the tank, off of that concrete water interface, okay? The energy from the sensor goes all the way through the sludge, and we get a great big echo off the bottom. Now, we also get a discernible echo here off of this layer of sludge. So this would be your well-settled blanket, okay? We also get an echo here off of this surface, all right? So what we do on the instrument is we turn that signal on its side. And this is an area of this presentation where I wish we were in a room together and I could actually see your faces because sometimes it's a little hard for people to get their heads wrapped around turning this thing on their side and, and what it's showing us. But again, here, here is the sensor, okay, to the left. Here, this hash mark represents the tank bottom. So this horizontal line is from the surface of the water down to the bottom of the tank. Now, we just saw we get a strong echo off the bottom of the tank. There it is, okay? We get a less strong echo right off, just off the bottom of the tank. And then here is the upper interface. Now, actually, what I should, I should back up. This is an echo profile of a well-settled sludge blanket. So, for example, the fact that this profile is very vertical at this point means that as you go down through the water column, okay, you've got clear supernatant, clear supernatant, and then bang, we're getting a really good echo off of that blanket, okay? Now, that's very good to see because that means that you're getting good settling conditions. You don't have much of a rag layer or a fluff layer or dispersed solids. This would be the type of signal when I see this, that indicates that this application would be very appropriate to pump off of. In other words, you could use this signal, tie it into your pump controls, and you could run your RAS or WAS or whatever, if it was a thickener, you could run your thickener pumps um, off of a signal like this. And there are plenty of places around the country that do that. Now, contrast that with this graphic. This would be the signal that we'd see in a not so well settled um, uh, process. And, and let me show you why. We don't have that vertical aspect to the interface that we had before, correct? Now we are tracking that one. This signal is more indicative or more, it reflects that graphic that I showed you a few minutes ago with the two layers of sludge, okay? Now, here's the difference. As you're coming down through the water column, all right, you get a little bit of an echo right here. Then you get a little bit more and a little bit more, and then you get a fairly well-defined um, echo. That would be the case where you've got sludge up to about 2.8 feet, and then maybe another two feet of fluff or dispersed solids above that, okay? So it's, it's less typical to pump off of a situation like this or control your pumps because the interface is, is more ambiguous. It's less, uh, well settled, it's, it's less reliable in terms of being there all the time. And of course, this particular profile was, a, it's just a snapshot. Just like all the methods that I showed earlier with a sludge judge and a, a cups on a stick and those, those are, those are basically snapshots. They're, they're discrete measurements in time. Okay. We're providing continuous measurement. 
So if this kind of condition persists where we were able to reliably track this interface, then it could still be very well be, you know, a right uh, application for pumping off that signal. But with the diurnal flows that happen and that type of thing, if half of the day, the clarifier is kind of in a upset condition, it's not good settling, that would be a harder type of uh, application to track. So this would be a graphic, this is right off the screen of that control unit for that previous signal. We've got a well settled interface down at 2.8 feet, and then we've got a couple of feet of dispersed solids above that. The good news is, is that we can give you both of these outputs. We can give you the well settled interface and we can give you the upper limit of that dispersed solids zone. The cool thing about that is you could then use that instrument to do a dosing study or to monitor, um, monitor your settling, basically. If you see these two outputs the same or very close to the same, you know you've got very good settling conditions. When in your trends, you start to see uh, the dispersed solids diverge from the, the main interface level, that's a, that's a heads up that something may be going on in the process. Okay, another good time to stop for questions. Yeah, we've got a couple questions this time, Michael. So the first one, um, if you cover this later in the presentation, let us know. But uh, Tobias asked us, is there a daily calibration of your meter? daily cleaning? Do you have any instrument drift and how would you verify your reading over time? There, there, once, the, once the instrument's calibrated at the beginning of the, the initiation process or when you commission the instruments, there really isn't any other calibration process. You, you will still want to use an independent method like a sludge judge or a TSS meter to periodically check uh, to make sure that the, the sludge blanket sensor is reading correctly. But if you bring these trends into your SCADA system, you're going to have a good idea of when, when it's time to address the sensor. As far as maintenance, we let those signals in the trends tell you. So for example, if you get a big buildup of algae on a sensor, that might take a couple of months for that to happen. Well, a couple of months into, your, into that life of that sensor, you might see the reading go a little bit wonky. You go out, you clean the sensor, everything comes back to normal. Now you start to learn what your 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 maintenance schedule needs to be. Uh, but there's really, it's not rocket science. Okay. Another question is, how do you install this type of device when you have a rake arm that sweeps around the clarifier every 15 or 30 minutes? Will that cause the uh, the cable to tangle? Right. So, uh, we have a flexible assembly uh, that, that sits on the end of a rigid piece of pipe and it positions the sensor about six inches below the surface of the water. And that, that flexible assembly has a flex joint on it that when, so, and a guard that guards the sensor. And you clock that assembly such that the guard is what that skimmer arm uh, contacts as it's passing the sensor. And what happens is the sensor just rides up over the skimmer arm and then splashes back down in the water. So that actually accomplishes two things. One, it, it keeps the sensor from getting ripped off. Uh, and two, it actually cleans the sensor. Sure. And, and somewhat to Tobias's point, um, making sure that that guard is perpendicular to your skimmer arm, you might want to check that every six months or so. Uh, that, that would really be one of the main things you'd have to do from a PM perspective. Uh, final question for you, Michael, is uh, customer says they've tried this technology in the past and they pulled it out as it was not reliable. Is there any sort of a guarantee with your instrument? Well, about the only thing that I can say is, you know, we routinely will loan a, a prospective customer a unit uh, and we put a cell, cellular modem in there and we let them trial it for 30 days or so. And there's an onboard data logger that has a week's worth of capacity. Uh, it, it, the, the modem allows me or the folks at our, at our company to dial in and ensure that the instrument's set up correctly, first of all. We can see that signal 
And then what we what we ask customers, you know, we, we loan these units out for free, but the only thing that we ask is that that they do a program of sludge judging or whatever their manual method of measurement is uh, and share that data with us. Be diligent about how those measurements are made. And what we'll do is we'll take that plant generated data and overlay it on the trends that, that the instrument generates. Now, hopefully that, that all falls into place and we show good performance. If it doesn't show good performance, then we may have some other things going on like pore settling or what have you. Uh, and, and, and there are ways to, to mitigate those discrepancies. So we can work with the plant to kind of understand what's going on and uh, hopefully get past that. So that's, that's really the only way that we guarantee um, you know, I wouldn't just blindly get one of these and throw it in the tank and just, you know, expect it to work 100% of the time because there are some processes that it's just not the appropriate uh, technology for. But we'd be willing to work with anybody to uh, to see whether it would be appropriate. Yeah, and we'll we'll show some of those uh, that that information that you were discussing previously. We'll show that later on in the presentation where we plot, you know, manual measurements versus our trend. Okay, that's it for now. Out, right. You can keep on going. All right. Okay, so I'm I'm actually going to show you some examples of the data that we've actually collected from these trials, or uh, or after a trial has been done and a and a, a an instrument's been installed. So this is an interesting set of data. Or, or what I'm going to show you the next couple of slides. Um, the way I've set this up is I say, you know, let's just say that you're the brand new manager of a wastewater plant. And once you kind of get settled in, you want to, one of the things you want to understand is, you know, where your blankets are at. So you tell your staff, hey, you know what, I want you to go out and bring me data from tank number one over the course of a week. And so your staff goes out, they sludge judge that tank once a week, and this is a week's worth of data you're looking at, and they bring you this data back, okay? Well, as a good plant manager, you're going to say to yourself, self, now, what do I do with this data? Do I, do I connect the dots with a straight line or do I do a best fit average? What do I do here? Well, good manager that you are, you say, go get me more data. Stab that tank multiple times a day and bring me the data back in a week, okay? So then this is what they bring you. Well, this is not really a heck of a lot more clear than the previous set of data, right? So you still have the question. So you know what's that blanket doing in between those little red squares? Remember, sludge judge measurements or whatever the method like that, that's not continuous monitoring. Those are discrete measurements, points in time, okay? Well, so this is the picture that continuous monitoring gives you. The cool thing is, is those sludge judge measurements were spot on, Okay, they really were. There's a couple of them that are just a little bit off, but they're in the right place and in the right direction. I mean, there's nothing here that's that's you know that's really out of line. What's very interesting is is you've got these flow patterns, and they're diurnal. Okay, meaning that they occur day after day, and then you've got an event here that we happen to capture, and this event was probably a pump that was left on, and right here the operator got a sludge judge measurement and probably took some action so that this didn't go all the way to zero and continue on. This is a potential wormhole where uh, you start sucking the supernatant out of the tank. You deplete the tank of sludge. And of course, it's, it's important in a thickener, especially a wise thickener, that, uh, that you, you keep a certain level of sludge in there. And because if you're going to the drying process, you want good thick sludge coming out of the bottom of that that uh, that tank they call it the under under uh, flow concentration so one thing so so these folks actually bought a unit based upon this one set of data because this type of event right here had been happening uh frequently here's another set of data it's probably in some of your backyards uh this is an example of measuring both the settled blanket and the dispersed solids and the black triangles are um, uh, sludge judge measurements. And notice how those measurements are either on the blue line or in the red zone or somewhere in between. That shows the ambiguity of reading a sludge judge, but it also shows 
um, that they're doing a pretty darn good job, actually, you know. And you can start to see where there are certain areas where the, 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 the two outputs are together and then they diverge different places. So uh, you can get that kind of feedback. Here's an interesting set of data. This was in a thickener at a drinking water plant up in Jersey, I believe. Um, and they had a piece of, uh, they had a, a competitive piece of equipment in there and they'd never seen this kind of pattern. And this was the first week of data that we downloaded for them. Um, and they took one look at it and said, that's exactly what we should have been seeing all along. And what, what that means is, is they know their process. And the way that this thickener uh, behaves so their, their, their clarifier blows down about every eight hours and the pumps come on for several minutes, <laughs> excuse me, and then goes off. Well, that's exactly what we're seeing here. You see the pump go on, the level in the thickener goes up, the pump goes off, and then the thickener level settles, you know, the, the, the sludge settles. Eight hours later, the pump comes on and it repeats that cycle. So this stair step pattern in the trend is exactly reflecting the conditions in that process. And this is what I was re referring to earlier. You're gonna learn uh, by looking at the trends, kind of what's going on in that tank based upon your process. This is another one that's kind of close to home for your Florida folks. Um, back in 2012, the Republican National Convention was supposed to take place in Tampa but we had tropical storm isaac come through and delay that for a day or two well, we had a trial unit in plantation florida which is just to the west of uh, fort lauderdale and this is the screenshot of the radar as that storm was going through the area okay well here's the trend of data that brackets that event and i love this set of data because it's just it, there's so much going on here but you've got normal diurnal patterns. This is in a, a final clarifier, secondary clarifier. You've got good sludge judge measurements that agree. You've got somebody out there that's, that's doing a good job. Now, then the storm starts coming through. Flows start to increase. This right here is where they lost power, where the plant lost power the first time. Well, once the power came back on, the instrument rebooted itself, kept on going. They made some adjustments, dropped the blanket back down again, a whole nother uh, group of, of storms came through and they lost power numerous times, yet when the instrument you know, rebooted, kept on going, they're dealing with some pretty high flows and all that, the storm passes and the flows start to subside. So, I mean, what this shows is that the instrument is reliable and it's out there working uh, even in bad weather and, type of, and that type of thing. But, but there's another story that's here in this slide that's not readily uh, discernible. And that is these sludge judge measurements, they didn't get there by themselves. There's a guy that was out there with a sludge judge in a hurricane with a 20 foot sludge judge. Like who wants to be that guy, right? So believe it or not, he's now the superintendent of that, of that organization. So he took one for the team and it paid off. Okay, so benefits. So just to kind of summarize with the sludge blanket end of things, you got continuous monitoring 24-7, 365. You bring that information into your SCADA system. Those trends can provide feedback on settling conditions, on, on your flows, and so on. You can use that signal to optimize your RAS and WAS pumping if it's appropriate. You maximize that underflow concentration to make sure that you're only sending good thick sludge to your, to your drying process. It also can help you prevent that solids washout like we saw almost in that set of data. Obviously, you can get warnings. You can, if you've got the kind of SCADA system that allows it, you can push those warnings to your phone so you don't have to get out of bed every night there's a storm and go check on your clarifiers. Um, obviously, this helps to minimize exposure to wastewater plant you know, uh, process liquid, and you've got pretty good reliability. All right, questions? The only question we have this time, Michael, is uh, is this product designed to measure only um, sludge in a clarifier, or can it do other underwater interfaces? 
Oh, great question. Uh, absolutely. Um, it's used in industrial processes. We've measured potatoes. We've measured potato uh, uh, starch. We've used them in uh, the coal industry. There's uh, like aggregate um, machinery that takes, uh, you know, aggregate that's mined out of the ground and sizes it through screens and sifters. And, and there's, we've, we've used it in uh, fracking operations, all kinds of other types of applications. Okay, that's it for now. Okay, I should say that as long as you've got a, a water-based solid separation process, it's usually a pretty appropriate technology. But again, that's why we, we routinely loan a unit to customers, because if there's any question as to whether it would work, you know, we, we, let's just go prove it. You know, if it's appropriate, great. If it's not appropriate, we'll be the first to tell you. Okay, so th the other use for this technology is the same exact sensors. Uh, but their, 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 their settings are changed uh, to make the sensor respond very quickly. As most of you probably know, blankets in a clarifier don't move very fast. But in a gravity filter, things happen very quickly. So we take the same sensor, we add a turbidity sensor to the face of it, so it's two sensors in one, and we put it at the top of a gravity filter just below the level of the wash trough. Of course, we filter this water to take, um, and let's just take the case of drinking water plants, to take the solids, there's, there's very small solids that are in there, the turbidity, the, that, that need to come out because all kinds of nasty critters can adhere to those and uh, make its way into our drinking water if we don't filter them out. That's why we filter, is to get things like cryptosporidium spores, Giardia spores, um, they, they go into a portion of their life cycle where they're like a walnut. And unfortunately, just disinfection won't penetrate and kill those guys. So that's why we filter. So we're filtering small particles out of the water and that filter is gonna get clogged, okay? So then we go into a backwash. And backwashing simply means that we reverse the flow, we push water up through that media so that it fluidizes that media bed. And that, that fluidization causes all those grain particles, all the media particles to knock into each other. And that knocks off the fines that have been stuck in there. And those fines go up into this wash water trough right here, okay? And then they get carried away and that water gets treated a, another time. And so does the solids. The solids have to be collected and dealt with in a drying process or what have you. So we put the face of the sensor just below the level of the wash trough. And with the ultrasonic sensor, we're tracking this interface, this media water interface, which is a very simple uh, application for us. That's a very dense, very good surface to bounce that, that sound signal off of. Well, then with the turbidimeter, we tell you when this wash water is clean as it's exiting the filter. And so that's a very simple but very powerful tool in managing uh, gravity filters. Okay, here's a close up of that that uh, uh, turbidity uh, sensor. You've got two lenses there, all right? And to give you an idea, this sensor is about a, uh, it's about a $2,300 sensor. Without the turbidimeter, if it was just a sludge blanket sensor with a wiper, it'd be a little under $2,000. So this is about a $325 adder. It's a very inexpensive little turbidimeter, but it's very, uh, uh, it's very repeatable. It's, I, I won't say it's very accurate. It is pretty accurate, but not as most of you understand turbidity. If you're if you deal in a waste in a drinking water plant with bench top turbidimeters, you're measuring out sub, you know a couple of decimals of an NTU. We don't really care about that level of accuracy. We just want to understand the trend and when that wash water is trending clean. So the way that the turbidimeter works, we, the, the, obviously the, the ultrasonic works exactly the same as previously, but you've got one lens where you've got a light generator or a light source, and that's an infrared LED, and then you've got a light receptor under the other lens. And the idea is if you have stuff in the water, it's going to reflect light and you'll be able to pick that up. And then we scale or calibrate it to uh, zero to 50 MTU. So it's just that simple. If, for example, that's, that sensor was out of the water, 
the turbidimeter continues to work, but there's nothing in the air. So we, we usually measure zero turbidity when the sensor's in air. To give you an idea, this is a comparison of our turbidimeter alongside of a, uh, a fairly expensive, um, you know, pretty darn accurate turbidimeter in a, a filter in California. And from 50 NTU down, we're, we're basically in lockstep. And we, we had multiple sets of data that, that showed the same um, correlation. To give you an idea, this is a, a, a screenshot of a signal out of one of these filter applications. So you can see how tall and narrow that spike is, that echo. In other words, you get a really big bang very quickly because it's such a dense interface. Okay, so typically what happens, um, you know, you can, you can rely just on the, uh, the fluidization of this bed with the flow rate of the water coming up through there. Uh, but since, oh, I don't know, 20, 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, they came out with a couple of ways to, to assist with that fluidization. Uh, one of those methods are what, we call, what they call surface sweeps, where you've got these, these jets that are on a rotating bar that go around the surface of the media uh, just at the beginning of the backwash, and it helps to break up those media grains. Uh, since then, there's been a, a process uh, element called uh, uh, air scour, and air scour really is the latest and greatest in terms of helping to, to do the heavy lifting of breaking up or fluidizing those beds. So when you're in filtering mode, your water level is up above the wash trough. When you get ready to do a backwash, they typically will bring the, wash, the water level down, and that leaves our sensor hanging in air. So at that point, once the sensor is out of the water, we're no longer reading an ultrasonic value. And typically, the turbidity reading goes to zero, okay? Now, at that point, they may do air scour or surface wash or what have you. And with air scour, they're running, they're running air and a low flow rate of water up through the media. And that really does help break up that media and loosen the fines that have been clogging that, that filter. Well, at some point, they turn the air off and the water level starts to rise. At that point, the water level starts hitting our sensor. We start measuring the media level. We start measuring the turbidity, and the wash water starts flowing into the trough. So that's kind of how a backwash works. And this is a set of trends from that media level, from the ultrasonic and from the turbidimeter. The blue trend is the media level, okay? This is the point where the water touches the face of the sensor. So we basically flatlined up until this point while the sensor's hanging in the air, water hits the sensor. And if, uh, you know, those of you that have seen backwashes, you know that wash water is very dirty at first. So the turbidity spikes, it goes up to 50, it pegs at 50. We don't measure more than 50 NTU. We really don't care how high that turbidity goes. We just wanna know when it's trending down clean, okay? At the same time that the turbidity spikes, the, the media level starts to, to, to register. And in this case, it ramps up and it holds, um, what is that, 46 and a half inches. I think the resting level of the media is 37 and a half. So we're getting about nine inches of expansion. Okay. Now, here's the thing. That filter is clean right around in this area. That's where the literature tells us we should be terminating this wash. Okay. Unfortunately, Operators have not been able to see this very clearly in the past. So most of these cycles are based on time. So in this case, this filter is backwashed for a, 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 actually more than six minutes, longer than it needs to be after that filter is quote unquote clean. Okay. This water, this 45,000 gallons of water is water that's already been cleaned once. Now it's got to be cleaned a second time. Okay. And that water has value. So it's very simple to do a business case based upon this kind of data that we generate with a trial unit. You know, if you've got 10 filters and you can save 50,000 gallons per wash and you're backwashing every other day, you do the math and that, that represents a lot of money. And that's money that can be used elsewhere. So um, that's kind of low hanging fruit with this instrument is if we get into a situation where you can optimize and save a lot of water, uh, that's really a big win. Now, 
I should mention that when we talk about expansion, we talk about percent expansion. Okay, so you got nine inches of expansion here, but filters are different sizes. Um, there's different depths of media in the filters. So we talk about percent bed expansion and percent bed expansion is, is literally the net expansion between the resting level and the highest point during the backwash. And that number is divided by the depth of the media, okay? Times 100. So as an example, uh, we've got 37 inches of media. We've got about nine inches of expansion. So you do the math and we're getting about 24% expansion in that case. That's that set of data that we just saw, okay? So how much expansion is best? Well, there's not a lot of really, really good guidance out there. Uh, that the EPA and others say that 20 to 25, maybe as high as 50%. Obviously, the performance of your filter is going to reflect whether you're getting sufficient expansion or not. If you have air scour, you may not need as much expansion as if you don't have air scour or surface wash. If you're relying on the fluidization of the bed, the flow rate going up through that filter, if you're relying solely on that, it's better to get more expansion if you've got the freeboard between the media and the top of the trough. Because obviously if you overexpand that media, you can, you can push the media up into the trough and that causes problems downstream. It's an expensive uh, problem. So, be, you know, it, it's great that we've got an instrument now that you can see exactly what kind of expansion you're getting because, you know, the guidance hasn't been 100% spot on, let's say. Also, where do you terminate that backwash? You know, I was pointing to a zone in that data of about 10 to 15 NTU. Um, that's what some of the literature says. There, there's other folks out there that are saying 15 to 20 NTU because you want to leave some turbidity in the filter to help with the ripening process. In other words, those little fines when you put the filter back online, um, they help fill in some of the voids and they make the filter start to filter more efficiently faster, okay? The, the bottom line here is now we have an instrument that actually lets you measure what's of interest. Backwash cycles, let's, let's put it this way, operators have only had control over flow rate and time because the way that filter backwash cycles were designed was, you know, with factors of safety because you couldn't measure what was really of interest you had to go with surrogate measurements. And so if we put the flow rate in this range and we run it for this many minutes, then we're going to be good. Okay. But now we have the ability to look at how much expansion we're getting and then to know when that wash water is clean. So you can conditionally control that backwash uh, based upon the conditions that are present. All right, questions. And yeah, we've got a few of them this time, Michael. All right, so the first one is from Kenneth. He asked, does turbulence during the backwash affect the operation of the sensor? Uh, turbulence, not so much. Now, if there's bubbles in the, in the wash water still, which that can happen, that can affect it. And that is going to be a lead into this next question, which I know you've kind of talked about, but maybe you can just share a little more information to clarify. Tobias asked, is there an effect or implication of the air scour step during the backwash? Will that part of the data set be invalid due to the presence of bubbles and gases? Yeah, typically during air scour, the sensor is, is hanging in air. So it's, it's kind of irrelevant. Now, it, there are some filters that, that air scour 100% of the time during the backwash, and we can't do that application because bubbles are our enemy. Um, but most gravity filters, the air is turned off before the, before the water reaches the, 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 the sensor. All right. Leroy asks, is there a pH range at which the sensor operates? No. Um, obviously, we're dealing mostly with processes where the pH is in acceptable ranges. If this was an, if this is an industrial application where it's it's, it's an extreme pH value, then we'd have to look at possibly a different uh, material of construction for the sensor. And then we have another question from Kenneth. What about regulatory requirement for length of the backwash run? Yeah, that, uh, I do know that there are some states that require a certain length of backwash, regardless. Um, 
but I, you know, I just don't have that information at my fingertips. Uh, I think most states are open to the idea that if you've got data, if you've got good hard data that's repeatable, that shows that you don't have to go as long as they say you have to go, then they typically will allow, they'll give you a, a, a pass, basically. Not sure if that answered the question, but yeah, Kenneth, that might be one where you reach out to us uh, offline, and we can look at your, you know, your individual state's requirements, and uh, you know, we can have a discussion about whether or not it's something that uh, that we can use our data versus what what your state requires. And then, uh, Michael, the only other question that we've gotten is, uh, can our sensors be used to measure overall tank level? Uh, no, since we're underwater, uh, we're only measuring between the face of the sensor and the bottom of the tank. We 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 don't have an in-air level sensor to look to measure the li the liquid level. Okay, and and actually we have uh, one more that just came in. Can the instrument hit one NTU accurately? That is the goal of some of uh, Tobias's clients. That, that what they try to achieve. Well, I'm assuming that means trying to hit one NTU for the wash water at the end of the backwash. Um, now, I'll tell you this, our accuracy under, you know, ideal conditions is about a half an NTU. And again, for our purposes and what we're trying to do, that's more than sufficient. Um, but I'd also stress that it's best not to clean a filter to that point. What you want to do is to leave some turbidity in the filter at the end of the wash to help with the ripening process. So I hope that I hope that was a clear answer. But if, if again, if that's if I if I miss the point, then we can take this offline. No, he said it for the end of the high wash. So I think you got exactly what he's looking for. Okay, that's it for questions for now. All right. Okay. So you know, obviously, being able to identify savings in terms of water use that's great but but that's just a low-hanging fruit when it comes to backwash monitoring the real power of the instrument is that we can see elements in these trends remember the the trends that i showed from sludge blanket where the customer said we should have seen that pattern from the very beginning they knew their process they knew what to expect when it came to, to seeing their trends in this trend i can tell you this is pumped water You've got VFDs that are ramping that flow up, holding it extremely steady, and then ramping it back down. So you can actually see elements of that process in the trends. This is a great set of data. This is an elevated tank. In other words, the wash water for these, this, the backwash at this plant, it's gravity fed. So you've got an elevated tank with, with clean water. And then when they start the process, look what happens here. First of all, they're getting uh, very, you know, very quickly the turbidity goes up, they get expansion, the blue media trend, you see this oscillation, that's a fluttering valve. So as that valve opens up, it's wagging in, in the flow there. So you can see things like fluttering valves or, 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 or stuck valves. Now, in their case, they're getting really good expansion, the, the, uh, the media level drops, Here's an element that's, that's good to see. You see the turbidity drop very quickly. So in other words, all of that, that, all of those fines, all of that turbidity is leaving the filter at one time. That's a good indication that the filter is thoroughly clean, okay? But there's other things that are going on here too. <coughs> Excuse me. The, uh, and this is a case where they're trying to get the turbidity down to, you know, to, to sub one, and they do. And so, Again, this is drinking water, so that, that turbidity can go that low. Then they open up the gates and they put water back on top of the filter. And you can see their settled water turbidity go up, okay? At the same time, you see that media level compacting. Right after a backwash, the media level is fluffy. Or the, the media is fluffy. It hasn't been compacted yet because it doesn't have the water standing on top of it. But you can actually see that effect in this set of data. This is a great set of data. Uh, this is some interesting data out of Washington. Um, what they did was they backwashed at about 17% expansion, okay? And it took 
however long to get to what they called 5 NTU, all right? Whatever that time was. When they got 30% expansion, which was more in line with what the literature says you should be achieving, they got to that same 5 NTU 35% sooner, okay? Quicker. So what that means is, is that in general, the more expansion you get, the more you can push this turbidity curve to the left, okay? In other words, it doesn't take as long for that turbidity to get to the same level. And this is a set of data, that, this, this slide the next is out of Las Vegas. And these are tertiary filters at a wastewater plant, by the way. A very low expansion rate, and notice how this turbidity is not, I pointed out earlier in that previous set that it was very vertical and you know very decisive cleaning. And this one is very horizontal and there's a lot of chatter, which means that turbidity is taking its time coming out of the filter. When they increase the flow rate, look at the difference in that profile. Very decisive cleaning and they could have eliminated all this flow. So even though they're using a higher flow rate, they could terminate much sooner and save water, and we documented that. But not only that, the main thing is, is they're decisively cleaning that filter. They're getting all of the fines out of that filter, which is what you want for the overall filter health for the long term. Uh, this is a case where uh, with an elevated uh, wash water source, the rate of flow controller is not working. As the, as the water in the elevated tank falls, the, there's supposed to be a valve that opens up to compensate for that loss of hydrostatic head. And in this case, you can see it declining. You can also see where they go into an intermediate flow rate and then they tail off with a low flow rate. This is up in uh, Pittsburgh. This is in your, some of you guys' backyard. Westview Water Authority, uh, we did a trial for them quite some time back and we identified almost 11 minutes per wash that they could save water. And that was really significant because they had already identified they needed another water plant because of demand. And they were looking for every drop of water they could lay their hands on. And with the number of filters they had and uh, the amount of time they saved, we, it was not quite a billion gallons of water that they could lay their hands on to actually sell and deliver to customers. Uh, this is a, a, a a water reclamation facility out in uh, San Diego. And they figured they can save conservatively about six and a half minutes of flow. And this was one of the first ones where we realized the power of, uh, of, of how easily these instruments could pay for themselves. The, the supervisor out there says, Michael, could you please check my math? There's not many instruments out there where you can get less than a nine month payback period where it pays for itself. When I saw this email, I went and grabbed up everybody in our company and we got in front of a whiteboard and we did the math all kinds of different ways because we just couldn't believe how powerful those numbers added up. So that's one of the cool things about being able to do a trial in a filter is we can usually get a handle on how many minutes of flow we can save and give you kind of a back of the envelope approximation of what you might be able to expect out of, uh, out of your process. This is a tertiary treatment facility in, uh, in um, Thousand Oaks, California, and they conservatively figured they could save about 10 minutes of flow at the end of their wash, and they were able to. As a matter of fact, you can see right here, so month over month, that was the previous month's wash water usage. So just about cut it in half, and it's been that way ever since. A lot of these customers that we have out there, by the way, if anybody wants to speak to somebody, we've got references. Uh, Kenny, any questions? No, Michael, we don't have any additional questions at this point. All right, I'm just, I'm, we just passed the one hour mark, so I'm gonna kind of speed this up. I, I don't know if anybody from Punta Gorda is with us today, but uh, I'm getting ready to talk about you. It's a 10 mil, uh, million gallon per day for facility they've got four uh, filters and four solid contact units, which are, are like clarifiers. Here's their high flow rate and their cost of a thousand gallons of water. Total production inside the fence is about a buck 73, okay? We did a trial for them and this was the first set of data that we generated. Notice how anemic this turbidity curve is, this turbidity trend. 
So it begs the question, you know, how often are you um, uh, washing? Are you washing too often? And I asked that question, and they got back to me and said, well, you know, we're at about 70 hours, I believe it was. And I said, well, you ever thought about extending your filter run times? And they said, well, it used to be about 150, <clears throat> excuse me, but we had a breakthrough, and the Florida DEP came in, and that was an unpleasant experience. And so we decided to at least cut in half our filter run times. Well, I used to work for the Florida. I'm actually from Florida. I worked for the Florida DEP while I was going to school. And I can understand, you know, that you really don't want your regulator all up in your business if you can help it. I, I totally get that. So, so they made a policy decision to shorten their filter run time, okay? And as a result, it had all kinds of consequences. And it was this set of data. That was the first thread that we started pulling on to watch this whole process unravel. All right, so what they did was they started extending their filter run times up to 120 hours, which is about a 70% increase in time, which resulted in about a 40% decrease in wash water used, which in their plant, in their process, represented about $65,000 annually in savings, okay? Then when they adjusted their runtime, of course, they were getting more turbidity coming out during the washes, and they adjusted the duration of their washes by about four minutes from what their previous runs were. And that resulted in about $21,000 in savings. Okay. So, and a 24%, additional 24% reduction in backwash water. So we're talking close to $90,000 in cost that they started to, uh, to recognize that they could potentially save. Now, then there's, there's more to the story because in their drying process, they were sending all kinds of water to their drying process. Okay, the hydraulic loading to their drying process was incredible. These solids contact units that I mentioned, this is a cross section. It's a long, narrow, rectangular tank with a channel in the middle and you've got sludge blanket on both sides. The water comes up, it goes, it, it comes through the blanket, it, the, it, it's clean, goes into the, to the troughs, and the, the blanket cascades into this trough. Well, they had chronic problems with turning on those sludge pumps and forgetting to turn them off or back and forth or, or leaving them on or not turning them on, and it was causing chronic problems. So they asked us to put a sludge blanket sensor over the channel and see if we couldn't control off of that and keep that blanket in an acceptable range, which is exactly what we did. Here's a photograph uh, of that channel going down in the middle. And here's a trend. And this is another case where the trend shows you what's going on in the process. Again, the pump comes on, um, it, it drops the level of the sludge, okay? Then the sludge builds up over time, the pump comes on, it drops the level of the sludge, the pump goes off, sludge level comes up. So they were able to keep that within about a six inch range, okay? So that drastically reduced uh, additional hydraulic loading to their drying process. So I'm sure some of you have seen, or you may even have these three walled cells for drying beds. There's an under drain under here, and they put a couple of feet of sand on top of that, and then you pump your wash water or your sludge slurry on top of that. The water percolates down into the under drain, it goes back to the headworks, and then you, you get in there with a front end loader and you take the sludge and you haul it off or you, you put it on a truck, you haul it off, what have you. Well, they were buying, they were using all 12 of cells that they had here, okay? When all was said and done, they got down to using one cell. And what we didn't understand was they were paying over a quarter of a million dollars a year for the sand that they were using for all 12 of those cells. The sand, the tipping fees for the sludge, after we pulled on all the threads in this particular application, it, it's eased, they easily are saving 300 or more thousand dollars per year. Any questions now? No, Michael, you don't have any. Okay, so I'm just about to wrap it up. This is the very last section. I apologize for running over. Um, you can get a, uh, these, these instruments can be in, configured in a standalone configuration where you can use any of these sensors with a control unit directly. And again, you just hang that off of the handrail. Uh, we can do what's called a wired RS-45 network where you simply take a twisted pair, uh, you daisy chain from the control unit 
to each power supply that's at each sensor location. And again, we can do up to 16 sensors. You can pick up four to 20s at your sensor location. You've got Modbus coming out of the control unit, speaking Modbus for all the sensors in the network. And then we now have a converter that takes that Modbus and converts it to four to 20. So you can get all your four to 20s at the, uh, at the control unit. Something that makes it super simple for the sludge blanket world is we can eliminate that twisted pair and do a wireless network. There's a number of customers we have in Florida, I think Pinellas County uh, uses this and it's been very successful for a number of years. So what this does is it really makes it easy to retrofit a plant. All you need is power out on the clarifier, which most clarifiers have power, and then everything radios back to the control unit. So three basic ways to do the installation. Uh, Remote monitoring by a cell modem. I mentioned that we, we have the ability to put a cellular modem in those units. So if we want to give you a loaner, we put one in there. Or if you purchase instr instruments, we can arrange to have a modem sent out to you after everything's installed so that we can help with the startup remotely and monitor it for you know a couple of weeks, make sure everything's copacetic. And then, uh, and then you just pop the modem out and send it back to us. Uh, and this is a a screenshot of the signal via that modem. I, I've got a utility that I dial in and I can actually see all those, all the signals and all the settings and all that type of thing. Okay, last chance for questions. I think we've answered them all so far. <laughs>